Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. Right. So, I'm going to read you the teaching text for today. It's 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17, and I'm reading from the NRV. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there may be no divisions among you, but that you are perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Jesus Christ be emptied of its power. I'm going to hand over to Adam this morning. Thank you. Good morning. I just love that bit where he realizes, having dictated that he's glad he didn't baptize anybody else, that he did have baptized somebody else, and has to correct himself quickly. Beautiful sign of authenticity, isn't it? Um, I want to start this morning by showing you one of my favorite cartoons. Like cartoons? Not like Popeye or Tom and Jerry, but like humorous little... Like, this is it, anyway. This is one of my favorite cartoons. You probably can't see it because the resolution is rubbish, but this is what's going on. Someone's teaching uh, like a class in a church, a membership class, and he's got kind of like a family tree of churches. You see it says 1 AD on the left and then branches out as the church spreads out. And he has a little circle and he says, so this is where our movement came along and finally got the Bible right. (laughs) And someone pipes up from the second row, if you can see it, Jesus is so lucky to have us. Uh, There's an awful lot here. If you look at it for long enough, it gets really sharp and like stabs you right in the heart. Because this is actually what we do. Just leave it there with you. That's why it's my favorite one. It'll eat away at you now. Um, You're welcome. The picture on the, the left there is really a picture of church history in many ways. It's a story of division and splits. Uh, There's no getting away from that fact. It will be a very real life experience for some of us in the room who will have lived through churches fragmenting, splitting. Some of us, our theology, our beliefs, the way we practice, our Christian faith will have evolved through our lives. We may have quite painfully had to move churches as a result of that. This is real life. This isn't just a history lesson. Churches find themselves in trouble. Churches find themselves splitting. And separatism, that kind of dividing, really, really hurts If you've lived through it, you'll know. Um, And if you haven't, I could introduce you to some people who really, really hurt as a result of what they've lived through. It's also a real challenge because when someone starts getting interested in God and they want to find out about the Christian faith, very often, my experience is they are completely confused as to what church they might go to. And they're full of lots of very legitimate questions about why are there so many different churches and why do they do it like that and you do it like this and they do it like that. And given that Jesus says, uh, by your love for one another, shall you be known as my disciples, this should be kind of unsettling for us. Now, this series that we're in is called Distinct. Uh, We've called it this because the church in Corinth, which is the church that's being written to in the letter we're reading together, is being called by Paul to be distinct from the world around them. I want us to note that it's distinct from the world around them and not from other churches. It's kind of an important thing to note. 
we will come to some sections in Corinthians where he talks about when it is appropriate to separate from other people who are saying they're Christians but not acting like it. But in general, so it seems in the public square, churches tend to spend more time talking about why other Christians are wrong than they do about the good news of Jesus Christ that actually unites us all. And I just want to start with that note. The call to be distinct is from the world around us, not from other Christians. Before we dive into the story that Heather's just read for us this morning, I want to point something out for us. It's very easy as we listen to this letter written to the church in Corinth a couple of thousand years ago to feel like they are rather silly. You know, I listed all of the things that they were getting up to last week, uh, all the things they were falling out about, all the problems they had in the church. And it's very easy to hear that list, to, to look at the things that are going on and go, what is up with those guys? It's why I started with the cartoon and this thing about the church dividing is we are not immune to some very similar pitfalls as that church in Corinth. You know, we're not beyond some of those same problems. We're not superior to them in any way, shape, or form. The very same things that affected them affect us too. And we're not learning about this church as kind of like an object lesson. So at the end of this series, there's no test. There can be a test if you want a test. No hands for that one. We're not learning about it out of historical interest, though it is fascinating to dive 2,000 years back into history and see what was going on. No, we, we're learning about this church in a city in Greece 2,000 years ago because they were impacted enormously by the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this letter, we have a very real example where we can see how the gospel has hit and changed their reality. And we want to be an open-hearted people who are reflective and responsive to the gospel doing exactly the same for us. We read this letter and we learn its lessons for us, for our hearts, that we might be changed. That we might know and enjoy Jesus more in our lives. That we might be more like Jesus that we might join in with Jesus more wholly with our lives. That's why we dive into these historical things. That's why we're combing through the text together. It's going to take some humility from us. Here's the context for what we've just read. If you were here last week, some of this will be a duplication, but this is for the other people who weren't here last week. So you can sit there and see how many points you score on the test in your head. Paul arrived in Corinth in the late 40s, maybe early 50s AD. He was there for about 18 months and he spoke about Jesus every day to anybody who would listen. And he saw some people turn and start following Jesus, including two influential Jewish people. The leader of the synagogue turned and became a follower of Jesus. And then his replacement also turned and became a follower of Jesus. There was fruit, but it wasn't without hardship. In fact, the opposition that Paul experienced meant he was so downhearted that one night he needed a vision from God to come to him and to say, keep on going because he was so fed up. After 18 months, he heads home uh, via Ephesus and he leaves behind in Corinth the church. We've no idea what size it is. We don't know hardly anything about it. We just know there was a church there. And three years later, Paul writes this letter to them. So we're sort of early, mid, 50s AD. Living memory of Jesus. And he writes this letter in response to a report that comes to him from Chloe's household. We don't really know anything else about Chloe. It seems like she was probably quite a successful businesswoman. It seems like she sent people between Corinth, where the church was, and Ephesus, where Paul is at this point, and as they arrive and they meet him, they're telling him about what's going on in the church, and he is literally, I'm sure, pulling his hair out, utterly bewildered at what's going on. And what we've just read is that they were quarreling. Quarreling. They were forming cliques and separating from each other in the church. Now, Many of you are sitting in the same seat that you sit in every single Sunday morning. 
That is not being cliquey, that's just being stuck in your ways. In Corinth, they were sitting together, grouping together. We're not quite sure the extent to what was going on, but it's even possible they were refusing to meet with each other. They just wanted to be in their little clique. This is the wrong kind of distinct. The church is called to be distinct, but not like that. That is separatism. That is discord, strife. And actually, the word here, I hear there are quarrels amongst you, is the same word Paul uses in Galatians. So in Galatians chapter 5, there's a bit that some of you will know off by heart called the fruits of the Spirit. And they are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Or whatever they are in the version you learn them in. In the verse before that, in contrast to the fruits of the Spirit, Paul paints out some acts of the flesh. The fruits of the Spirit are what you want. The acts of the flesh are what you do not want. And one of those is the exact same word. There you will find it translated discord or strife or quarreling. It is not a good thing that they are doing. And from this passage here and through the rest of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, Paul begins to unpack why they are being so silly. What is causing them to quarrel and divide? And really his summary is pride. Pride is getting into them, and it is affecting how they act towards each other. And so we've started quite slowly, but in the next four weeks, we're going to get all the way through to the end of chapter four, I think, pretty much. And in that time, we will see the roots of the problem and the fruit of the problem, and Paul addressing both of them. There's some quite famous passages in that process. Let me explain the situation for us. Can we just have the passage back up where it says, I follow Paul? Lovely. The one before. Real. So we're looking at that bottom verse, verse 12, there together. This is the situation. Paul is the founder of the church. There's something very special about the person who's told you about Jesus. Some of you will remember that person. Be very significant for you. Paul was the founder of that church. He taught well. He knew his stuff. He was a smart man. By his own admission, he was not the most eloquent of preachers. In fact, um, if you're nervous about your public speaking ability, you should read Acts chapter 20. And there's a story in there when Paul visited a city called Troas. And he's speaking long into the night and a young man sitting in the window. And he falls asleep while Paul is preaching, which none of you would ever do while somebody is speaking at the front of the room. And, uh, and he's sitting in the window, but there's no glass in the window. He falls out of the first story window and hits the floor. Paul was not the most eloquent or engaging of speakers, is the sort of summary. But he was the founder of the church, and so some people were very loyal to him. And they were saying, I follow Paul. I am Paul's man. I am Paul's woman. We are Team Paul, hashtag. And uh, some other people, they were like, no, no, we're not Team Paul. We're Team Apollos. Who's Apollos? Again, we're in Acts chapter 18. If you want to learn some context of what's going in Corinth, that's the place you need to go and read in your own time. What we find is that Apollos was an incredibly skillful and charismatic public speaker. If TED Talks existed in the first century, Apollos would have done two. Watched by tens of millions on first century YouTube. His story comes in the end of Acts chapter 18. He was from Alexandria in Egypt. Last week, I said that Corinth was the most happening city in Greece. If that's true, then Alexandria is like 21st century New York. Like it's the center of the world. The smartest people, the, the place that if you can make it there. That's where he's from. If you're an impressive public speaker and you're from New York, if you're an impressive public speaker and you're from Alexandria, like he's the best of the best. And we bump into him. He arrives in Ephesus, and there are some friends of Paul's called Priscilla and Aquila who have come to faith, and Paul worked with them in Corinth. They leave Corinth with him. He leaves them in Ephesus when he returns home from Antioch, and they hear Apollos speak, and they go, wow, this guy is good, but he's not quite got it right. Take him into their home. He says, they explain the way of Jesus to him more adequately. It's one of those moments you really wish the Bible gave you a little bit more material. 
Like, what happened in that? I don't know. I would love to know. Anyway, he does that. They do that with him, and he moves on. At Paul's encouragement, note this. Paul encourages him to go from Ephesus to Corinth. They are friends. They're on the same team. And he goes to Corinth, and in the end of Acts chapter 18, what you find is this. It says he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents and proved that Jesus was the Messiah. He stood up in Corinth. And he dazzled them. And he won. The Jewish opponents were left fluffing their lines. Those of you who were here last week, what did the Corinthians love? They loved to win, they were competitive. So when someone arrives, who's good enough to actually win? They're like, well, Paul preached in the synagogues. He needed God to turn up in a dream and encourage him to keep going. But Apollos, man, he's amazing. We're not team Paul, we're we're team Apollos. That's what's going on. The rest of what's going on in this verse, we have to kind of piece together, we hold it a little bit more lightly. We don't really know if Cephas is Peter. It's just different language. We don't know if he went to Corinth. You've got to know, of course, that none of these people are actually in Corinth either. Just for the record. This isn't the churches dividing around particular leaders, though I'm sure there were leaders in these cliques. They're calling on people who aren't even there, who are friends and working together. Maybe we think that the people are saying, well, actually, you might follow Paul and you might follow Apollos, but I follow Cephas. Maybe they preferred the Jewish flavor of Paul's following of Jesus. Maybe they thought, well, look, Paul was the one who preached two words, and Apollos is really good, but do you know what, Peter? He traveled with Jesus for three years. He was his best friend. He walked on water. He divided up the bread with Jesus and fed five thousand. He saw it all. He got to go into the room where the girl was brought back to life. He's the OG. He's the best. Why are you following Paul and team Peter? But they're not just having a comical argument over a nice evening drink together. They're like so fixed on one thing that they're saying that other people are wrong and they're separating from them. It's like if you sit over here, you're team Paul. And you come in on a Sunday morning and if you like Paul best, you sit over here. If you like Apollos the best, you come sit at the front because the speaker's brilliant. If you like Peter the best, they're dividing over this. They're not talking to each other. They're lost in love for one another. And then there's a fourth group. Well, you might follow Paul, and you might follow Apollos, and you might follow Peter because he was with Jesus, but we follow Christ. (laughs) I want you to note that Paul doesn't congratulate them on getting it right. He condemns the lot of them. He's like, what are you doing? There must have been something about that group that was smug. Superior. Maybe they were super spiritual about it, you know. Yeah, you will do that, but we're we're the ones who really have it. Ever met anyone like that? Because this isn't just a first century issue, friends. We're not immune to exactly the same problems that this church faces. Now, I love this church very dearly and I'm absolutely not preaching at you and suggesting that there's cliques or that you all... I'm just not. And this is, there are some really tough passages coming up in 1 Corinthians, which if you've read ahead, you will know. And I'm, we're already reading and talking about how we're going to handle those things. I sat down to write this preach. I thought this one's going to be easy. Did the, did the plan. I've done the reading. I'm like, yeah, very simple. It's called Undivided. We call the church to be one. Then you read it. You go, how do I apply this in such a way that it doesn't help everybody in the room feel like they're being told that they're being divisive? To be honest, I still don't know how you do it. But there's no subtext to what I'm saying. I'm just explaining their story and offering it to you. My friends, here's the deal. Somehow, something has got into the Corinthians' hearts and it is catastrophically spilling over into church life. That's what's going on here. Somehow, something has got inside them 
And it's causing them to live and to act and to do the very opposite of what Jesus has asked them to do. By your love for one another, the world will know that you're my disciples. Oh, I'm Team Paul. I'm Team Apollos and we don't talk. Something's got inside them. Last week I introduced a saying, which I'm sure will get referenced quite a few times in this series. What's in the world tends to be in the church. A competitive, proud city, lo and behold, has a church in it where competition and pride are rife. And it is catastrophically spilling over into the church and it is robbing the gospel of its power. That's Paul's concern. Did you know the last verse? Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Here's your question. What in the world today is also present in the church today and is catastrophically spilling over and stopping the church be the beautiful bride of Christ that she is called to be? I don't need answers on a postcard. It's, not, it's a rhetorical question. It's one we need to answer, though. Let me personalize it for you because this isn't about them. It's about me. What that's in the world has somehow got into me and spills over negatively on the church around me and prevents her from being as beautiful as she's supposed to be. What has got into you, into your heart, and spills over to those around you and stops the church being all that she is called to be. That is the dagger of this passage to our hearts. We can read it and laugh it off. We can read it and move on quickly. I can give you three points about Paul's response to the problem and what they're unified on. But the knowledge about what unifies the church is not necessarily what we need. What we need is a heart that wants to be one with those around us. This passage, I think, ends up forcing us to ask some questions about transformation and the transformation of our lives. Because there's a very easy trap that we can fall into. And we're not all like this. And I've not got anyone particularly in mind as I say it. But it can be the case, particularly in England, particularly in a church like this, where we're all kind of nice people. And we come into the church and we do our nice things and we do our money, we do some kind that we serve and you know, say hello with a smile on our face to one another and, and we think we're there. Jesus has transformed me. I smiled at someone I didn't know and said hello. Jesus has transformed me. I didn't see everyone who put their hands up for this. It's not a dig. Because I put my hand up in the middle of church to help pack down, even though it's not my turn. Check me out. It's so easy to think we've been transformed. And we're there. And we need God to come through to us in a few areas of life, like some external stuff, but we're saved. By grace, I'm saved, I'm done, washed, clean, sorted, heaven. When this is the deal, and this is what this letter of, to the Corinthians, and this passage especially tells us, is the transformed areas of your life as you come to Jesus, they're going to need transforming again. I think back to what I was like 12 years ago when I moved to Harrogate. And I thank the Lord that he transforms us. You were so kind to us, God. I'm a different man in so many ways. 
because of his work in my life. I think back 25 years. No, I am that old. And stop it. And uh, so when I met Jesus, man, he worked in my heart. And I can tell you all sorts of things he's done in my life to transform me. And some of the things that got transformed, I've sat there and gone, well, I'm better than I was, Jesus, but when I look at you, (laughs) and then I look at me, there's a very long way to go. And the call to follow Jesus, my friends, is a narrow path. But it's one that takes us along a path of transformation towards being like Jesus. Not so that we can feel all smug and holy. Not so that we've earned something from God, but for the good of the world around us. Because God's work in our lives spills over into the lives and the world around us. In this sense, transformation is more like compound interest than the breakthrough of hitting oil. In a compound interest, mathematicians, finance, economics people, we in? Little finance lesson for you all? From me. (laughs) If I could get you a breakthrough from God right now, one area of your life, done and dusted today, many of you would bite my hand off. We pray about it, we call it out week after week. It's wonderful, I'm all for it. But if I could get you that breakthrough and you could have it, you've got a breakthrough. And you've got a breakthrough. You just That's what you've got. It's steady. And you might have jumped a bit, but you're still just steady with your breakthrough. If you embark upon a process where every year, or every Sunday, or every morning, fancy that, you come to Jesus and he changes you just a little bit. And then the next morning he changes you just a little bit more. You'll be perhaps a long way below your moment of breakthrough for a little while. Until such a moment as compound interest kicks in, at which point the graph, this is a brilliant maths lesson, goes like this. And the rate of increase in acceleration it accelerates and accelerates and accelerates until it's gone. And it's sky high. Is that right, finance people? Just, just, just check in with the, uh, the people who know this stuff. I give you a breakthrough this morning. You'll change, but that's it. Or you can every single day be transformed, and your transform bits can get transformed. And the transform bits that were transformed again can get transformed again. That's, that's what happens. And that's why when you sit with someone who's been following Jesus for 40 years, you're like, man, alive. Something attractive about your heart. I distinctly remember the day, a couple who are in the church, they've, they've now moved been following Jesus faithfully, done all kinds of incredible steps of faith in their lives, just heroes of the faith, came after their grandson was stillborn. And I stood in the row behind them at church, and they worshipped their socks off. And I was was bawling. The church was small. I was cut to the heart for them. And they just went. And then there was a lull in the music as happens and we were small enough at this point that people could just shout out and actually be heard and she prayed out this incredible prayer of faith i asked them about it years later she's like every day you say you trust jesus and you find you're able to trust him more and more and more and more i've trusted jesus for small things and now what would have seemed big seems small i was like man i want to be like you when i'm older I want my transformed bits to be transformed, to be transformed, to be transformed. Amen? Transformation in the Christian life is compound interest, not the breakthrough of hitting oil. It's slow and steady. We're committed to two things here in this church. We want people to be able to encounter Jesus here and now. In whatever the world is like in 2024, wherever people are coming from, we want them to be able to meet Jesus right here. But we also want to build people of faith who can follow Jesus through the decades. When I sit and I think about how are we doing church, I want to reach people now, and I want people in 20, 30 years to be better positioned because of what we can put into them here. It's not a show. This is serious. 20 years ago, the Chinese government looked at the future of the automotive industry, and they went, this is going one direction, electric cars. They gave tax breaks and investment to all sorts of companies to invest into battery technology. 
Because to have an electric car, you need a very high capacity battery. And you need it to be able to discharge really quickly so you get power into the wheels and it can go. And they invested and they invested and they invested. And no one bought them for years. Because they were rubbish. Petrol cars were way better. Yet today, loads of Western companies buy Chinese car batteries because they're amongst the best. Because they've spent 20 years going, this is where it's going, we're going to do it. I drive a car with a Chinese battery in. Those of you who have Western car manufacturers, electric cars probably got Chinese batteries in. This is the deal. The companies that were inventing the batteries and developing the batteries now went, hang on a second, we've got the most valuable bit of the car. You know, if you've got a petrol car, the engine's the most valuable bit, and if you can get the engine, then you put everything else on it. If you've got an electric car, it's the battery, because basically you've got a battery, a motor, four tires, and some steel. And so if you've got the best battery technology, you just got to get someone to design you a car. You can stick it on top and you're selling cars. And so you're beginning to see companies selling cars that were battery manufacturers. Five years' time, they'll be commonplace on the streets. Because 20 years ago, some people sat and went, what's going to be the case in 20 years? Oh, this. We're all in. We are all in for people still following Jesus in 20 years. And not still following him with like, by the skin of their teeth, but strong, established, not God smart people, God connected people who know him for themselves and are able to pass on the faith to others. I cannot give you something this morning other than Jesus that's going to help you do that for 20 years. But we can absolutely embark upon 20 years of walking together. That means that we'll all be up there on the transformation scale if we're prepared to do it. The road to life is narrow, said Jesus. Let me give you one place this bottoms out. A verse from the Bible that summarizes it. And then we're going to take communion together. Is that okay? Our culture loves self-awareness. We did the Enneagram last year as a staff team. And now when we sit and have staff meetings, we just throw numbers at each other. Oh, you're such a two. Oh, you're just being a three. It's part of a whole thing where people are really keen to know about who they are and what makes them tick. We demonstrate our self-awareness, some of us, publicly. We're authentic people. We share in such a way that previous generations would never dream of sharing and still makes those generations feel very uncomfortable. We really value self-awareness. We call it authenticity. Jesus doesn't call us to authenticity. He doesn't call us to self-awareness. He calls us to self-control. And there is a world of difference between the two. You can know some really dark stuff about your own heart and be completely self-aware about it and do nothing about it. You can know that you so desperately need the approval and praise of people that it leads you to do things you shouldn't do. And yet you can keep on doing it because you need the approval and praise of people. You can be self-aware, but still a million miles away from what Jesus is calling you to. Or you can deliberately and consciously realize that that is a very bad way to live that will only end in ruin, says someone who's walking this path, and apply yourself to going to the healthy place for affirmation and value rather than the unhealthy place. I can run to crowds for affirmation and value or I can go to the Father in heaven who says I'm his beloved son and nothing can ever snatch me from his hand that he delights to be with me. That's true. Sometimes it's hard to realize. It's very easy to realize the praise of people. And so it takes deliberate and conscious self-control to pursue health rather than unhealth. You can know about yourself that you like to Mask pain in your life through escapism. 
eating food, drinking alcohol. Doom scrolling, watching hours upon hours of TV, looking at pornography. You can know about yourself that you like to mask the pain by escapism, and that's self awareness. But if you keep doing it, you continue to put poison into your body. Self-control says, because the vision I've seen of Jesus is so good, and because his love for me is so vast, I am going to deliberately and consciously resist the normal pathways that now exist in my mind that take me to those places as soon as I feel pain. And I'm going to fight it and go, no, I'm going somewhere healthy. That's self-control. And it's not a one-time thing. But that's a repeated thing until normal pathways get changed. And even once they are, it's still harder work. You can have self-awareness, but we're called to self-control. The transformation, friends, of the Christian life is not just to know about yourself. It's to take control of your flesh and see your spirit come to life. My transformed bits are transformed by the grace of God. Are transformed by the grace of God as I partner with him and walk the narrow path to life. The Corinthians didn't. The Corinthians let competition come in. And like the weeds that grew up with the seed in the third soil, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choked out the growth for the Corinthians. My friends, we are not immune. We need to look at the soil of our hearts. Luke chapter 8 tells us that the seed that falls in the, the heart that is good and noble is the one that yields the harvest. To go to our heart and go, is it good? Is it noble? And where it's not, walk with Jesus to see transformation. Otherwise, we will end up in exactly the same place as the Corinthians. There's a quote by David Pryor, Tim, on one of the slides. It says, we are the disintegrated ones. I've got all my notes here. We are the disintegrated ones whom Christ is gradually making whole so that we become like him, integrated and entire. It's the slide after, is Christ divided? There's not that slide. Wow. I did not do my job properly. I'm going to say it again because it's a really good quote. We, are, and this is in the context of, is Christ divided? When you read the Bible, you find Paul spouting rhetorical questions. It's because he thinks the argument people are making is ridiculous. Romans 6, you find the same thing. Here, he thinks they're being absurd, and so he fires rhetorical questions at them. First one, is Christ divided? The answer is no, if you were wondering. It's not Christ who's divided, but we are the disintegrated ones. We're the ones who aren't integrated. We lack integrity, that's what he means. But we are the ones whom Christ is gradually making whole so that we become like him because he is whole, he's integrated and entire. We talk about integration, we talk about everything being in one box, not six different boxes for the different bits of your life. If you're someone different over here than you are over here than you are at church, that's called disintegration. If you're someone different in the presence of God than you are in the presence of another person, it's called disintegration. We want to be integrated people, have integrity. We want to be in one box, understand who we are, what affects us, and the effect we have on other people, so that we can be good news and light in a dark place. Galatians 2.20. This is after was Paul Cruz. Ah, yes. I did make a slide. But I can't see it because my eyes are dead. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, 
but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is Paul healthily demonstrating what the Corinthians needed to do in another letter. He says to them, was Paul crucified for you? The answer is no. Jesus was crucified for them. And the crucifixion of Jesus means this. He says, were you baptized into Paul? No, you were baptized into Jesus. And being baptized into Jesus means this. It means that when we come in faith to Jesus and we place our life in his hands, we receive his offer of life, his offer of forgiveness, his offer of wholeness. We are crucified with Christ. Our lives, the old us, is nailed with Jesus to the cross. And it's no longer us who live, but it's Christ now who lives in us. When we baptize people, as we will in the beginning of April, we put them under the water as a sign of going into the grave with Jesus, that the old self dies, is dead and buried. Fortunately, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, and so we're able to bring people back out of the water into the new life that they have, which is Jesus' eternal resurrection life. The life I'm living, he says, I'm living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is the motivation. Everything we need for a life of transformation is given to Jesus Christ. We don't pursue this pathway of transformation so that we make ourselves more pleasing to God so that he might save us. God doesn't love me any more when I get up here in 40 years' time than he does right now. Loves me when I'm good. Loves me when I'm naughty. Loves me all the time. But I pursue that path because what we've seen of Jesus is just so glorious that we want to be with him and to be like him, to join in with what he's doing on the face of the earth. That's the call to the Corinthians. That's the call to you and I. The call is, will you be joined into Christ like this? Will you be joined into the wholeness of Jesus that Paul points to? Later on in 1 Corinthians, we find a verse that says that we are one body because we all share one life. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. The act of communion is the declaration that we are joined to Jesus, into his life. And we are joined to one another, no longer living for ourselves, but living for him, aware of how we spill onto other people and conscious of walking that pathway of transformation. We're going to take communion together to finish this morning. We're going to do so as we worship. As we take the bread, we're going to do it together. So in a moment, Sandra, do you want to come back up? In a moment, we're going to see, well, Sandra and Beth are going to lead us. Thank you, Beth. And we're going to come down, we're going to get... a cup of juice and our bread. This one is gluten-free. The bread, not the juice. These are glutinous. It's all non-alcoholic. Going to come up as we start to sing. We're going to get our bread and our wine. We're going to all have it together. And in a few minutes' time, once everyone's got some, we're going to eat the bread together. It's not all from one loaf. I chopped it up from pita breads this morning. But the symbolism is point. We are all eating the bread, which is the body of Jesus. There are not multiple Jesuses, my friends. There is one Jesus. And as we eat the bread, we eat and share in one Jesus. We drink the juice as a sign of his blood, his death, his blood poured out on our behalf that we might know forgiveness and transformation. If you need to confess sins this morning, as I've talked about the difference between self-awareness and self-control, I would encourage you very strongly to say to God before you eat the bread, God, this morning you have put your finger on something in my heart and I need your help. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help me to change. When we take communion in the wrong way, we put ourselves in a tricky spot. Because we're saying one thing with our actions, we're submitted to God, but a different thing in our heart. But this is a moment for integrity and integration. Please confess your sins to the Lord before you take communion. We're happy for anyone who's a follower of Jesus to take communion here. If they're children, you're very welcome to take communion. If your parents are happy for you too. If you're not a follower of Jesus here this morning, 
you can in this moment choose to follow the Jesus I've been talking about this morning, the Jesus we've been singing to. You can take communion as an act. But that is what you want to do. He would love to meet you. Or you can sit and watch those of us who are followers of Jesus take communion this morning. I can invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for us. And then why don't we come and get the bread and wine. Once everyone's got it, our leaders in taking communion in a moment or two. Father God, save us from pride. Save us from a, a chronological arrogance that would look back into the past and scoff. Save us from being blind to the weeds that grow in our own lives, the stuff that's of the world around us and not of you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that your forgiveness is powerful, that nothing can stand against it. Thank you, Lord, that your transformation is complete and eternal. That in the moment we come to you, we're yours, saved completely. Yet you draw us on a path of transformation through the rest of our lives. For your name's sake, for our heart's sake, for the good of the world around us. Pray, Spirit of God, come. Even now as we stand before you, put your finger on things in our hearts that need to change. We don't want to be a self-aware people, Lord God. We want to be a self-aware and self-controlled people. Help us. Change us. Lead us. We ask in your mighty name. Amen.